Uh, right, so this is. Uh, <laughs> I was going to talk to you about a new project I started recently uh, about looking at what happens at higher elevations. Can you move aside? Well, I haven't really started. <laughs> <laughs> Still, we sit in your belly. <laughs> oh, <laughs> this is and so it's about looking at um, climate change. <laughs> Uh, at high elevation, and because I've just started, I don't have that many results yet, but I thought I could present a general overview of what's been done in the last, say, 10 years. Also about uh, looking at trends and so on at uh, high elevation. So, <coughs> so for this talk, I will talk about uh, temperature trends at high elevations. I will show some results uh, showing trends of other variables. Uh, and then I'll look at what's been done to uh, try and look at different sensitivities uh, at high elevations, so clouds, snow ice, albedo, water vapor. I will briefly talk about some model studies that have been done. And then I'll move on to, um, which is more what we have been trying to do, which is to try and use satellite uh, observations in order to look at all these sensitivities at high elevations. So, I guess most of you are aware of this, but uh, lots of high mountains have lost quite a lot of ice in the last say, 50 years or whatever. So this is uh, one image I found of the Kilimanjaro in Africa that shows uh, the ice cover in 93 and in 2000. So, uh, obviously there is some variability in there, so I don't know if they chose those particular years because they were the most extreme. But anyway, just to illustrate the fact that the ice is melting at high elevation. And for the mid latitudes, so that's for the tropics, but for the mid latitudes, um, this uh, ice melt could be very um, bad for um, all of us uh, because uh, those mid latitudes um, mountains are situated in countries where you do have a large populations and they do supply a lot of the fresh water. So for example, uh, the Tibetan Plateau, which is the, the largest area of high elevation, which is sometimes referred as the third pool, um, uh, has all these rivers uh, going into China and India, uh, which are the, the, larger, the biggest countries, well, as in population. Uh, but also for the Western US, uh, the Rockies are also giving a uh, lot of water. Uh, the Andes are, stretching all across Western South America, so that's also lots of countries. And then the Alps as well, uh, just to give you another example of a mountain range that's in a largely populated area. So for the temperature trends, uh, there's been quite a lot of studies, and here I was going to start with the Alps, because um, this is probably one of the most observed uh, mountain range uh, in the world. And um, recently, they've uh, even created a reanalysis data set for uh, that particular region. And using this reanalysis, they found that in the, from 1958 to 2002, they observed a one degree increase in temperature uh, over the Alps, which gives you a 0.23 degree C per decade. Uh, so this plot just shows you in black the observed temperature trends for all sorts of locations in the Alps. And the gray shows you what the real analysis is uh, also giving. So you can see that all these places have a positive trend, uh, and then in some places it's actually quite large. <coughs> now, for the Tibetan plateau, uh, which, oh, God, it's a bit blurry, but uh, anyway, this is just a, a map of the, the region. So the Himalayas are here, with the Mount Everest not here, but then you have all these highly elevated area, which is the, called the Tibetan Plateau, which is at at least 4,000 meters above sea level. Uh, and then, so basically you have China. So for the Tibetan Plateau, there's been, I've chosen arbitrarily a few studies. Uh, so this, the first one here dates uh, from 2000, by Lian Chen, and they look, they used uh, 97 <coughs> stations, observing stations over the plateau to look at temperature trends. Um, most of these stations, oh, I forgot to write this down, but uh, started, uh, I think, in the 70s, uh, and then carry on. Some of them actually date back to you know, earlier than that. And uh, here, I'm just showing the trends for one uh, station and for the northern hemisphere, just to show you that the trend, the increase in temperature for these locations is actually, uh, the rate is 
actually bigger than it is for the northern hemisphere. So there's a warming there, but it's also a warming that's faster than anywhere else for the same kind of latitudes. Um, on the right here, this is the uh, average for all the 97 stations for the annual uh, temperature. So the trend for this is 0 0.02 uh, degrees per year. But that's the trend for the winter. And what's been observed is uh, that for the winter, the trend is actually twice it is for the annual mean. So there is an increase in temperature that seems to occur uh, mostly in the winter. Uh, and it's the trend is about double what's found for the annual trend. Um, so, so the temperatures, so there's a trend in the temperatures and increasing trends. Uh, but people have looked at other uh, measurements, uh, one of them being the diagonal temperature range. And what this study found is that's also increasing. Uh, so you've got like three plots, one for annual monsoon and winter. Monsoon being more or less the, uh, the summertime for this region. Uh, and they find that this uh, increasing diagonal temperature range uh, comes from an increase in the maximum temperature that is faster than the increase in minimum temperature. Um, another thing that's been found here on the right is that the, uh, the trend is actually increasing with altitude. So here, these plots show you the trend in degrees per decade as a function of the elevation that's been beamed into 500 meters. Uh, so here you've got from 0 to 500 meters, and this is from 4.5 to, so 4.5 kilometers to 5 kilometers. So you can see that in general, as you go higher, your temperature is increasing faster. Thank you. Uh, and so that's the trend per season, and again in winter it seems to be clearer, clearer trend. Uh, right, so that's for the Tibetan plateau. Now what happens in the Rockies? Um, so in this study by Wang Wala and Miver, they used, um, again, ground observations uh, over the southwestern part of um, the Rockies in Colorado. And they also found an increase in temperature um, using data for more or less of the century. Uh, the, the trend is slightly less than for the other uh, places like the Alpha or the Tibetan plateau, but it's still uh, significant. And the, for the Rockies, um, they had two sets of observations. So here you've got the, uh, the temperature uh, anomaly versus uh, time, and uh, the dashed line shows one set of observations, and then the line shows another. So just to point that different stations do give similar results, and that the increase in temperature has been uh, more acute uh, starting in about 1985 uh, for this particular location in the southwestern Colorado. They also find that the um, maximum temperatures uh, increase mostly in summer, but in winter it seems that the increase is affecting mostly the minimum temperatures. So seasons are important here. Another uh, study that I found, which I thought was a bit different, so I should show it as well, is another way of looking at the trends and high elevations. And what they do is they use this classification, climate classification, and they looked at specifically this type, the alpine tundra, tundra um, which is defined as a region where the maximum temperature in the warm season is between 0 and 10 degrees C. So this map uh, shows you where this uh, climate classification was found uh, from 1901 to 1930. So you see we've got some areas in California, in Colorado, Wyoming, and a little bit in Utah here. Uh, and then you've done the same thing using observations from 1987 to 2006, and as you can see, uh, this classification is slowly disappearing. Um, especially while there's none in Utah, uh, Colorado seems to be mostly affected. And what happens is um, those areas that used to be classified as by children, their maximum temperature during the warm season have now gone beyond 10 degrees. And they found that those remaining areas where that, that still fits the classification uh, actually have an average temperature that's closer to 10 degrees than it was before on average for these regions. So uh, that's another way of looking at those trends. So, right, so temperature is increasing at high elevation and it seems to be increasing more rapidly than anywhere else and it's also increasing more as you go up in elevation. Uh, but now our other things have been found to change as well. So I found two studies. Uh, one was looking at clouds, cloud amounts, uh, and they used observations of the Tibetan 
plateau from 1971 to 2002, and they found, on average, a decrease in cloud mass, which is uh, consistent with an increase in temperature. Um, and I know that people have looked at near surface winds, and they found that, uh, and then they looked in China, so kind of on the eastern edge of the plateau and in, uh, in the Alps, and they found that in both locations they do see a decrease in wind speed at high elevation. And uh, they also found some uh, evidence for an, uh, that this decrease is actually more acute at higher elevations than lower elevations. So these are the kind of changes that have been observed so far. And, um, and now I wanted to look at um, what would make those temperature change faster at higher elevation? What are the factors that make um, the temperature change specific? Like what, what is so specific about high elevations that anything that's changing is changing the temperatures faster than anywhere else? So one study, uh, so they found two studies that looked at the uh, relationship between the cloud amount and the temperatures. Uh, the first one looks at a very specific region uh, over the Tibetan plateau where you seem to have more or less constantly this very uh, thick stratus cloud deck that's there uh, a lot of the time. And they found that the, uh, the, the, the cloud fraction in that area was uh, changing with temperature. Um, so they, 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 just, they well, so anyway, that's the temperature they observe there in the of the circles, and that's the cloud amount. And one thing you may notice here is in that particular area, they actually found the cooling in the last, uh, well, since 1985, which is opposite to what other studies have found. But the main thing is that they found that as uh, the cloud amount decreased, temperature increased, and vice versa. So they find a relationship there. Another study uh, did uh, something similar, looking at the total cloud amount, but this time they've looked at a much wider area of the Tibetan plateau, and for their area, the temperatures are increasing, but they found the same relationship between the temperature change and the cloud amount change. So when you have a decreasing cloud, you have an increasing temperature and vice versa, but also they found um, that at night, the cloud amount increases, which is uh, still compatible with an increasing temperature because at night most of the effective clouds have been in the infrared and that's uh, causing an increasing temperature. But otherwise they agree with these people except that where they're looking the temperature trends are different. Okay. So another another factor that may be influencing the change in temperature at high elevations is obviously what happens to the snow cover. Um, and so uh, two, I found two things that may influence uh, the albedo of the snow and that could explain why it's melting and why you tend to have an increase in temperature. So one study <coughs> looked at the impact of dust and they looked um, over the Colorado mountains uh, because um, what happens is in the desert, um, soil has been disturbed. So actually more dust is now be, um, traveling to high elevations and it's depositing onto the snow than it used to be, say, a Santa Rico. Um, and obviously, if you have a drought in the larger area, these droughts will make the dust uh, more able to fly around, and you will have more deposition at high elevation. So what they've done is they looked at um, the um, snow water equivalent. So it's basically the amount of snow that you measure as the equivalent in water. But basically, if it's zero, it means you have no snow, and if it's more than zero, then you, you start to have snow. So as these curves go down, it's just the snow is melting. And they looked at uh, the time where the, uh, the melting was complete. So sometime in spring, you have all the snow melted. And that's what they're looking at. So they're looking at a subalpine region and an alpine region. So it's just different elevations. In 2005, where the dust deposition levels were considered as normal, and in 2006, where you had a severe drought that year, and so there was more dust uh, deposited at high elevation. And what they find between these two years is the time at which there was no so left, snow left on the ground was much earlier when you had this, um, more dust deposited at high elevation. 
uh, whether you look at uh, the lowest elevations or the highest elevation. So that's one thing that's influencing, um, uh, that could be influencing the temperature trends more at high elevation than anywhere else. Uh, another, just for information here, uh, I found uh, another study that actually also observed an increasing test deposition uh, using an ice core on Mount Everest. So this kind of phenomenon may be also affecting other regions and it's very different. But I haven't found any study that's linking the snow melt in the Tibetan plateau to the dust. Uh, another uh, factor that could influence the, uh, the albedo of the snow and accelerate its melting is soot. Um, and as people looked at the increase, found an increase in soot deposition also uh, over the Tibetan glaciers. And uh, here I'm just showing the trends uh, in the amount of soot that was found in the snow at those elevations. So these could be other factors that are influencing temperature trends. And then another factor that could be um, influencing the temperature is water vapor. So if you uh, increase uh, the amount of moisture at high elevation, you will increase the long wave downward projection, and that will also have an impact on the ground temperature. Um, so one study using ground observation was done over the Tibetan plateau from 61 to 2000, and they found an increase in their observations in specific humidity. And what they've done so to, to, to see what effect this increase in specific humidity would have on the downward fluxes, they actually calculated the fluxes the change in downward flux uh, that you would get for that particular observed change in specific humidity, and that's what is plotted here. So each box <coughs> corresponds to the, uh, an elevation range. So this is high and medium and lower. And then uh, this is winter, spring, and summer and fall, and that's the change in long wave flux uh, that you find for the observed uh, change in humidity. And you can see that, especially in winter, do have a strong impact of that change in humidity on the fluxes. Um, and then also you can see how it's affecting the more the highest elevations than the lowest elevations. <coughs> so in order to really understand the interplay between different factors and try and figure out which factors are more important than others, uh, obviously it's easier to use models. So that's what these studies done, just trying to use um, GCMs or you know, smaller scale models to, um, to try and understand the effect of those different uh, factors that I've just um, talked about. So one study looked at the impact of the soot deposition, and they do find that indeed it has a positive feedback for the Rockies, um, and they obviously notice it most in late winter spring when we have the next season. Another study looked at the, um, so use actually the um, Gary Russell's version of the GCM, of the GIS GCM, to see if that GCM could simulate the warming at high elevation. And, um, and then once that warming, well, they verified that this warming could be uh, correctly simulated. They uh, then looked at what factors influence that, uh, that warming, and they found that humidity and snow cover both had a large impact on, uh, on the change in temperature at high elevation. Uh, another study um, looked at different, again, at different factors that could influence uh, the warming this time over the Tibetan plateau, and they found two different um, important things of those factors, depending on which region of the Tibetan plateau you're looking at. So they find that on the eastern side, so kind of mainland China side of the Tibetan plateau, plateau um, the clouds, changes in clouds seem to have the most impact on the changes in temperature. Uh, but on the western side of the Tibetan plateau, snow cover seems to be uh, having the main influence on the change in, uh, in temperature. And then just to show you a quick uh, plot from uh, the middle study. The, um, so this is the change in temperature as a function of elevation uh, modeled. So these little circles are the model simulation for 61 to 1990. And then the diamonds show you what the model is predicting for the change from 2000 to 2019. Um, so you can see, and the observations are all plotted as these triangles. So for 
our period, so for the say late uh, 20th century, uh, the model seems to be in accordance with the observation as far as the warming is concerned, so like the, the, the amplitude of the warming, but also the fact that it's changing in elevation. Um, and then that's the prediction, so you see that uh, this kind of increase in, the, in the warming as you go up in elevation is gonna be maintained in the forward simulations, um, and then you don't have any worse warming. So just to summarize quickly for the sensitivities, but for the Rockies, um, the change in temperature was found to be sensitive to changes in the deposition of dust and soot, uh, which uh, affects the snow cover, which affects the albedo, and um, we absorb solar radiation, and then we get high temperatures. For Tibet, it's a bit more complicated. You have some areas where you, uh, the, the temperature change seems to be sensitive changes in clouds, uh, or in water vapor, or in snow cover. So the problem here is we, the only studies that I've presented to you have been done using ground observations, which are, um, which could be problematic um, to talk about. So one thing about the ground observations in high elevation regions is you can only put a station where you can actually have access to it not just to install it, but also to maintain it and make sure and repair it and, and all that. <coughs> so for example, uh, in one of these studies, those little black dots show you where they had observations. Uh, but as you can see, this entire area has, well actually not, there are some stations there, but they are very few apart. So you can't really have the full climatology of what happens, for example, over the Tibetan plateau, since you can't have observations everywhere. Um, another thing is, uh, related to what I said before about the cloud sensitivity, like so these people had found on the eastern side of the plateau a cooling trend when everywhere else it seems to be a warming trend. That's another study I found that's actually finding a, a cooling trend. Uh, these people used two stations on the eastern flank of the Rockies, and there they also find a cooling trend. So that begs the question of, are these trends actually depending on where the station actually is with respect to its surrounding? Because for these two stations, one of them is really high up and really exposed. So the snow is drifting, you have uh, winds, so it's kind of affected by large scale changes. Whereas the other station is more like surrounded by mountains and then you have this kind of basin like, so cold air in the morning stays there for much longer than it stays anywhere else. So, I mean, are these stations really representative of what's going on on the large scale or not? That's a uh, problem. So one way of trying to look at this otherwise is to uh, maybe use satellites. Uh, obviously, the satellites give you a global view, so there's nowhere where they can't make observations. Um, and they also fly above a place on a regular basis, so you do have a good uh, temporal sampling as well. Um, there are some issues with satellite uh, observation, which is probably why not many people have um, tried to use them before. Um, there's resolution issues. Uh, when you look at a mountain area where attitude may be changing a lot within a pixel, uh, that's, that could be a problem. Um, also, the satellites won't be able to see if you are in the shadow area or in the sun inside area or anything like that. Um, another problem, um, for most of the instruments they've been flying so far, they're all passive remote sensing, so they are strongly influenced by what happens at the surface. So if you have a very bright, snow covered surface, uh, then these instruments are going to have trouble, say for example, to see clouds, which are also bright over bright, so that's complicated. And then also, obviously, <coughs> if you want to look at trains, it's probably not the ideal platform because they've been uh, up there for only 30 years. Um, um, so that also explains why people probably didn't use satellite observation that much. However, they have the advantage of giving many different observations of many different things at the same time for the same location. So you can have multiple variables, which uh, then is very useful to look at sensitivities. Then you can start looking at what changes and what impact it has on other things that's changing. So the <laughs> big question though is, can we actually really use certain observations of a large high elevation areas? Um, and 
And that's where our work starts, because the problem, lots of observations have been um, compared with ground observations, like assessed, right? Like the errors have been estimated, but each time it's been done, it's either over land or over the oceans or in areas that are actually accessible. So it's not very clear if a very good project can actually work over high elevation areas. So that's the kind of work we start doing. Uh, for the radiation, so uh, in this case, surface fluxes, which actually are not directly measured, but are an estimate based on uh, measurements at the top of the atmosphere. Um, there's been studies um, looking at how well uh, different um, data sets were performing over the Tibetan plateau. So these people you, uh, looked at shortwave and longwave flux, surface fluxes. Uh, and they did find indeed errors, large errors, when we were in regions, like for example the Himalayas, where the altitude is changing rapidly. Whereas over the Tibetan plateau itself, because it's like such a huge flat-ish area, uh, those instruments had less problems. Um, so we looked uh, over the southwestern Colorado because we have access to ground-based measurements of long-wave surface fluxes. And this is a comparison between those ground-based measurements and the series uh, long-wave surface fluxes. So you can see that we didn't find any drastic error. We didn't find any large biases. Uh, and then also the average error was within what um, the people who actually created these measurements, they, what they found for other places. Other, so that's quite reassuring. Um, those different colors correspond to different seasons. These are monthly means. So we do detect maybe some issues in the winter uh, that we are now looking into greater details. But overall, I think the point here is not to say that these measurements are perfect, but just to say that they are not, they are not uh, worse than they are anywhere else. So if, we, if you use those measurements knowing the error, you should be able to get some interesting information. For clouds observations, we um, tested the uh, ISKI clouds, uh, so the um, amount, but also the uh, clouds of pressure, using a active instrument that's probably going to give you the best um, measurement of where the clouds are and where they are, uh, that we could find um, for the Tibetan plateau. And we found two things. We found that indeed um, ISKIP uh, tends to uh, not see some clouds, especially uh, when they are close to the surface, so it's probably due to uh, problems with snow cover. Um, and also, it has problems detecting thin clouds. Uh, but these two problems have been identified before. So again, we didn't find anything that was specific to high elevation regions. Another thing is uh, that the cloud pressures um, tend to be overestimated when you have more than one cloud layer with this gift, which is, again, a problem that's been identified a long time ago. Um, and, but the good news is with, when we looked at, um, so with clouds that can so we actually know how many cloud layers you have in the atmosphere. And we found, so we did a little climatology of how often do you have one or two layers or more. And we found that most of the time at high elevation, we tend to have one big cloud layer and not very often more than one. So that problem with this gift may not be as bad at high, ele at high elevations. And we also find that, this, uh, that um, in the winter, which is probably a season we, we want to look at, uh, most of the time you have just the one cloud layer. Um, we looked at how often you had a very low level clouds, uh, and that seems to be not exactly um, season, season dependent, I mean, although in summer you tend to have a bit less of those, so that's something that we should watch if you were to use these observations. And another thing we've looked at is the um, distribution of optical thicknesses. So the red and orange are very thin clouds, and then you go towards thicker and thicker clouds. And we find that in winter, for example, you tend to have lots of very thin clouds compared to the thicker kinds. So that's another thing that uh, we should watch for these particular areas. Another measurement uh, that we would like to uh, look at is uh, water vapor. So in this case, um, we wanted to test if the uh, precipitable water vapor from metals, which is basically the integrated column of water vapor, if we could use that um, over high elevation regions, and then we used again <coughs> uh, Samoan, which is southwestern Colorado observations, to check that. 
problem for this comparison is we don't have a one-to-one, -one, we don't have the same kind of measurements of uh, the ground. Well, we have a specific humidity at the end surface, so we don't know what's going on above that. So I uh, checked in the literature, and there are actually quite a few studies out there of people trying to relate the column water vapor to what's observed at the surface. Um, and that seems to, the relationship between the two seems to be changing uh, depending on location and all sorts of things. So that was not obvious to, to use to check if Modis was doing a good job, but uh, there's a study that's been done over the Alps that does just that, using integrated color of water vapor and comparing it with ground observations. Um, and what they found is something similar to this. So you do have two different behaviors depending on how dry or how moist uh, your atmosphere is. Um, and uh, yes, so when you have a moist atmosphere, which is kind of, open, so here I've used as many station, weather stations I could use over the US, but trying to find them at different altitudes and see if uh, the relationship between the integrated column water vapor and the observation on the ground, if that uh, changed depending on location and attitude. And actually, it doesn't change that much for moist atmosphere. So as long as you've got um, your specific humidity above, say, um, three or four gram per kilogram, then the relationship between the column and what's observed at the ground is pretty much always the same, no matter what the location is or the elevation. Uh, where it starts changing is when you get to the drier uh, times or areas, which is represented here. And what we found is actually then we start to have a uh, dependency on elevation. Uh, and that seems to come from the fact that the, the, the column, the amount of water vapor in the columns decreases more rapidly as you go in altitude than the actual measurements at the ground. So I suppose that you some, have some influence of the surface on the amount of uh, moisture that's kind of not changing that much the uh, ground observations, whereas for the column it's not. So that's the relationship we found anyways, and um, the reason why we did that is we then wanted to go further and see if the relationship between the surface downward long wave radiation and the amount of moisture you have in the atmosphere, that relationship we could get using satellite observations, whether they're that good or not. So this was a study uh, that was done over the Alps, and these people looked, so found this relationship, uh, I've just put the um, ground observation here, but basically you do have this relationship uh, between the long wave flux and the amount of moisture in the atmosphere. And that's what we find over the Colorado. So that's our ground-based observation. So we also find a similar relationship. We check the feet and we get something that's similar to what was found in the Alps. And that's what we find using MODIS. So obviously there's some adjustment to be made because this is not the same quantity as that. But you still have that nice curve here. And again, it's similar to what was found for the Alps. So then we just use MODIS and series, so the satellite observations. And we checked if we could if we could get a similar relationship wherever we're looking at high elevations. Uh, and just to make sure that we do not have any observations, some kind of trend that's like have more errors in some places than another. And we found, so looking at different stations in the Alps, uh, in the Rockies, and in the, on the Tibetan plateau, we do find that we always get the same kind of relationship between the downward long wave flux and the amount of moisture in the atmosphere. And um, what's interesting here is that if I blow up this up, so now I go to the driest uh, areas, we still get uh, a nice uh, fit. And, uh, and this kind of encourages us to use satellite observations to look at sensitivity. So the sensitivity of the flux to changes in moisture as seen by the satellites is very comparable to what would be observed from the ground, which is what we would like to do. Okay, so to conclude. Um, so just to summarize, so I showed you lots of uh, different uh, studies that looked at high elevations that did find that there's a greater rate of warming at high elevations than anywhere else. I also showed you that to, to identify which factors are making this warming much greater at high elevations than anywhere else are a bit difficult to isolate. 
And so what we'd like to do is to use satellite observations in order to refine this and try and understand which factors may influence the temperature change at high elevations. Um, yeah, that's it. Studying these uh, long trends for uh, temperature, and uh, I'm, I'm mostly interested in the part that, my, I mean, my question is mostly focused on the part of the deposition. Uh, a major uh, component of it is the transport factor. Mm. Uh, have you studied, have you seen how this changes, or anybody else studied it? No, all I have is to study with the dust uh, in the Rockies, and it did look at the relationship between the area where you would have the, um, the emission of the dust, and they looked at the, you know, but uh, now I can't remember, did, did they look at the actual transport? I don't think so. No, just, I mean, locally. Yeah, I think it's a local study. I don't think anyone's done that. I mean, this, like, when you look at these papers, they say, oh, I mean, they kind of know where the dust is coming from, uh, on kind of average, but I don't know, you know, how precise that is and how much of that has been actually studied. Like for example, for Tibet, it's, it's, you know, it's coming from the um, Middle East and all these deserts. Apparently, the dust tends to be transported there. But has anybody actually physically checked the transport? I'm not sure. Yeah, there are studies. Yeah. 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 And, and especially when you when you see trends in the wind speeds. Well, of course, long track, long uh, yeah, those transport ones is uh, with local wind speeds are different things, but. If there is a trend, some in the wind, maybe also the transport is somehow important. Yeah, it could be affected. What, what, what do models say in general um, concerning the trends in temperature about <coughs> highland areas in general, not only the Sierra but also well, the Rockies? I mean, it's, it's a trend which is seen in highland areas, northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere. I mean, have you checked that? Because there are some studies where they um, <coughs> have seen in East, for example, Eastern African highlands, uh, there's there are different trends in temperature which are related also to resources in malaria, for example. Um, One thing I'm not sure is, for example, Andes, like southern hemisphere trends, I have no idea. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know how the models are doing for that. I was just going to ask, I have some colleagues who ran the Precy model for uh, Bogota region in, South, in Colombia, South America, and the Precy model, I don't know, if it's correct or not, but they had greater warming in the, the lower altitudes compared with the higher, the higher altitudes. So, yeah, have you seen anything? For those I did two? see anything along those lines. <coughs> there are some studies actually that tend to be a bit contradictory, but using models specifically, I haven't found anything. Uh, about the. Um, the comparison you, uh, you mentioned with the satellites and the, the, the testing you did with the um, topography, uh, the models will perform ev even worse. How, will, how can that affect your uh, studies? I mean, of course, the Tibetan plateau is fairly flat, flat as you yeah. mentioned, but uh, the Rockies and even worse, the Andes. I don't know what the models can really tell I'm you not sure about if you have issues about that. Because we were going to look at model output, but we were going to look at regional model output okay. for, this for the Rockies, for example. Uh, for Tibet, you do have enough great... Tibet is fairly flat. Yeah, and it's big. It's going to have more than one point. Uh, is the time with long wave radiation series sensitive to the Fourth wave of the same temperature. Yes. So, do you worry about you know, sort of consistency between the real world and the real analysis? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now that's tricky because those fluxes are estimated. So yes, they depend on what you give them, what information you give them for the surface properties, but also the, the column. Right. Wang Chong can give you more details about that because <laughs> he's looked at the the impact on the fluxes of all these different information that come in. And it is important, so you just have to live with it. Do you assess the further less, more sufficient the surface the temperature uh, there? Uh, when you 